Okay, now we come to another sutta, 78. Samana Mandika Sutta. Samana Mandika Putta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Now on that occasion, the wanderer, Ugaha Mana, Samana Mandika Putta, was staying in Malika's Park, the single hall Tinduka plantation for philosophical debates, together with a large following of wanderers, with as many as 300 wanderers. The carpenter, Pancha Kanga, went out from Savati at midday in order to see the Blessed One. And he thought, it is not the right time to see the Blessed One. He is still in retreat. And it is not the right time to see monks worthy of esteem. They are still in retreat. Suppose I went to Malika's park to the wanderer Ukaha Mana, Tamana Mandika Putta. And he went to Malika's park. On that occasion, the wanderer Ugaha Mana was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar, loudly and noisily talking many kinds of pointless talks, such as talk of kings, etc. But the wanderer Ugaha Mana, Samana Mandika Putta, saw the car carpenter Panchakanga coming in the distance. Seeing him, he quieted his own assembly thus, Sirs, be quiet. Sirs, make no noise. Here comes the carpenter Panchakanga, a disciple of the recluse Gotama. One of the recluse Gotama's white cloth, white cloth lay disciples staying at Savati. These venerable ones like quiet. They are disciplined in quiet. They command quiet. Perhaps if he finds our assembly a quiet one, he will think to join us. Then the wanderers became silent. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So you can see from here huh, that these uh, external sect ascetics, huh, they only, they not only have great respect for the Buddha's uh, monk and nun disciples, huh, even the Buddha's uh, lay disciples, huh, they have respect. Huh? And uh, they think huh, that somebody like this carpenter, Panchakanga, huh, he can teach them some Dhamma, so they want him to come. Uh, so they kept quiet. Huh? The carpenter, Panchakanga, went to the wanderer, Ugaha Mana, and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. The wanderer Ugaha Mana then said to him, Carpenter, when a man possesses four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic invincible. What are the four? Here he does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions and he does not make his living by any evil livelihood. When a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, and ascetic invincible. Stop here for a moment. So this time, instead of uh, uh, trying to learn some Dhamma, here he's trying to show off. Uh, he knows some Dhamma also. He's trying to teach this uh, Panchakanga what he knows. He says, uh, uh, if a person possesses four things, uh, then he says uh, this person is perfected. Uh, and what are these four things? He does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions and does not make his living by any evil livelihood. Then the carpenter, Pancha Kanga, neither approved nor disapproved of the wanderer, Ukaha Mana's words. Without doing either, he rose from his seat and went away, thinking, I shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the Blessed One. Then he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One his entire conversation with the wanderer, Ukaha Mana. Thereupon the Blessed One said, if that were so, carpenter, then a young tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic invincible, according to the wanderer Ugaha Mana statement. For a young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion body, so how should he do an evil action beyond mere wriggling? A young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion speech, so how should he utter evil speech beyond mere whining? A young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion intention. So how should he have evil intentions beyond mere sulking? A young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion livelihood. So how should he make his living by evil livelihood beyond being suckled at his mother's breast. If that were so, carpenter, then a young tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, and ascetic invincible. Yeah. 
according to the Wandra Ugaha Mana speed statement. Uh, when a man possesses four qualities, carpenter, I describe him not as accomplished in what is wholesome, or perfected in what is wholesome, or attained to the supreme attainment, or an ascetic invincible, but as one who stands in the same category as the young, tender infant lying prone. What are the four? Here he does no evil bodily actions, he utters no evil speech, he has no evil intentions, and he does not make his living by any evil livelihood. When a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him not as accomplice, etc., but as one who stands in the same category as the young, tender infant lying prone. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha immediately demolished this uh, Ugaha Mana's uh, statement by saying, uh, if, uh, if you talk about these four qualities, uh, then this uh, young tender infant uh, possesses the four, these four qualities. <laughs> uh, then, uh, if a, uh, so this, this person uh, who, uh, who, who possesses these four qualities, uh, he is not a, a person who has attained to the supreme attainment, uh, but he is in the same category uh, as a baby. Uh. When a man possesses ten qualities, carpenter, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic invincible. But first of all, I say, it must be understood thus, these are unwholesome habits, and thus unwholesome habits originate from this, and thus unwholesome habits cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. And I say it must be understood thus, these are wholesome habits, and thus wholesome habits originate from this, and thus wholesome habits cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of wholesome habits. And I say it must be understood thus, these are unwholesome thoughts, and thus unwholesome thoughts originate from this, and thus unwholesome thoughts cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing to the way to the cessation of unwholesome thoughts. And I say it must be understood thus, these are wholesome thoughts, and thus wholesome thoughts originate from this, and thus wholesome thoughts cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of wholesome thoughts. What are unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil livelihood. These are called unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is mind affected by lust, by hate, and by delusion. Unwholesome habits originate from this. I stop you for a moment. Uh. So here is interesting. Uh, one of the few places uh, where the Buddha mentions uh, mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects. Mm. But here, unwholesome habits uh, uh, originate uh, from the mind, uh, which is affected by lust, hatred, and delusion. Uh. And where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated. Here a monk abandons bodily misconduct and develops good bodily conduct. He abandons verbal misconduct and develops good verbal conduct. He abandons mental misconduct and develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong livelihood and gains a living by right livelihood. It is here that unwholesome habits cease without remainder. And how practicing, how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits? Here among a weak zeal for the non-arising of unarisen, even unwholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. He awakens zeal for the abandoning of arisen, evil, unwholesome states. He awakens zeal for the arising of unarisen, wholesome states. He awakens zeal for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, fulfillment by development of arisen, wholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. One so practicing practices the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. I'll stop here for a moment. This last paragraph is very important. This is about the four samapadanas, four right efforts. When we practice the spiritual path, we must continually look into our mind whether there are unwholesome states or wholesome states. 
uh, we should develop unwholesome states. When unwholesome states arise uh, and give us suffering, uh, we should immediately throw it out. Uh, don't entertain it. Uh, if you entertain it, uh, you're not putting effort in the right way. Uh, a lot of people, they think uh, the spiritual path uh, is attaining this jhana and that jhana. Or some people think uh, it's attaining uh, uh, this jnana and that jnana if they are practicing vipassana. But basically, uh, the spiritual path uh, is this four right efforts uh, to get rid of unwholesome states of mind uh, and develop wholesome states. Uh. Then that way uh, we change our character. Uh. Otherwise, you cannot change your character. Uh, so if you want to change our character, especially if you want to be reborn in heaven, uh, you got to change your character until you have the character of a deva or a devi. Uh. Uh, what are wholesome habits? They are wholesome bodily actions, wholesome verbal actions, and purification of livelihood. These are called wholesome habits. And, where, and what do these wholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to origi originate from mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is mind unaffected by lust, by hate, or by delusion. Wholesome habits originate from this. And where do these wholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated, here a monk is virtuous, but he does not identify with his virtue. And he understands as it actually is that liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom, where these wholesome habits cease without remainder. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh, this part also is quite interesting. Uh, a monk is virtuous, but he does not identify with his virtue. In other words, uh, if a monk is practicing the holy path, uh, he must always be careful uh, about the ego. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, somebody new on the path, uh, when you are virtuous, uh, you become uh, egoistic. Uh, you look down on others who are not so virtuous, whose precepts are not so pure as you. Uh, so uh, that's why here the Buddha says, uh, uh, you should not identify yourself with your virtue. Uh, and how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of wholesome habits? Here among awakened zeal for the non-arising of unarisen evil wholesome states. For the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. One soul practicing, practices the way to the cessation of wholesome habits. Uh, so this is again practicing the uh, uh, four right efforts. Uh, what are unwholesome thoughts? They are the thought of sensual desire, the thought of ill will, the thought of cruelty. These are called un unwholesome thoughts. And what do these unwholesome thoughts originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Though perception is multiple, varied and of different aspects, there is perception of sensual desire, perception of ill will and perception of cruelty. Unwholesome thoughts originate from this. And where do these unwholesome thoughts cease without remainder? The cessation is stated here. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. It is here that unwholesome thoughts cease without remainder. I'll stop here for a moment. So, in the uh, first jhana, uh, what little thoughts um, remains uh, is only wholesome thoughts, uh, thoughts connected with your meditation. You are, not talk, you are not thinking of any unwholesome thoughts. La. The mind is quite controlled la, in the first jhana. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome thoughts? Here among awakened zeal for the non-arising of unarisen evil unwholesome states. For the continuance, uh, etc. Uh, so these are the four right efforts again. La. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. One so practicing practices the way to the cessation of unwholesome thoughts. What are wholesome thoughts? They are the, the thought of renunciation, the thought of non-ill will, and the thought of non-cruelty. These are called wholesome thoughts. And what do these wholesome thoughts originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Though perception is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is perception of renunciation, perception of non-ill will, and perception of non-cruelty. Wholesome intentions originate from this. And where do these wholesome, sorry, wholesome thoughts, uh, and where do these wholesome thoughts cease without remainder? The cessation is stated. Here with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, 
is a self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of concentration. It is here that these wholesome thoughts cease without remainder. Stop here for a moment. In this second jhana, the mind becomes so concentrated uh, that no thought can surface. Uh, uh, and here this, this state of the second jhana sometimes is called the state of the Aryan silence. Uh, uh, whereas no more uh, uh, the mind stops uh, uh, thinking, uh, no thoughts at all. Uh, the only um, experiences uh, delight and pleasure. Uh. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of wholesome thoughts? Here among awakened zeal for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states, etc., uh, etc., et he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. One so practicing practices the way to the cessation of wholesome thoughts. Now, carpenter, when a man possesses what ten qualities do I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, an ascetic invincible. Here a monk possesses the right view of one beyond training the right thoughts of one beyond training, the right speech of one beyond training, the right action of one beyond training, the right livelihood of one beyond training, the right effort of one beyond training, the right recollection of one beyond training, the right concentration of one beyond training, the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right liberation of one beyond training. When a man possesses these ten qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, attained to the supreme attainment, and ascetic invincible. This is what the Blessed One said. The carpenter Panchakanga was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So here, the last part, uh, the Buddha says, uh, uh, this, uh, the supreme attainment, uh, this ascetic invincible, uh, possesses the... Uh, Noble Eightfold Path uh, of the Arahan, uh, the eight factors uh, of one beyond training. Uh, the one beyond training is the Arahan, uh, who has finished his work. Uh, and then the nine and the ten uh, is uh, um, knowledge, uh, knowledge, knowledge of liberation uh, and and the liberation. Uh, so, so here instead of the four qualities stated by Ugahamana. Buddha mentions, uh, uh, first you have to understand uh, what are uh, wholesome habits and what are unwholesome habits and how to uh, practice uh, the way uh, to develop wholesome habits and to uh, eliminate unwholesome habits. Also, what are wholesome thoughts and what are unwholesome thoughts and how to develop wholesome thoughts and how to get rid of unwholesome thoughts. And practicing in this way, uh, together with the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, uh, then one can attain the uh, enlightenment and, put, and becomes uh, an ascetic invincible. That is a supreme attainment. Uh, okay, we stop here for tonight. Nothing to discuss. If they want to progress, uh, they have to go to the best teacher in the world, and the best teacher in the world is the Buddha. Uh, study the Buddha's uh, words, uh, 
Uh, there's so much practical instruction uh, in the Buddha's words. Uh, instead of uh, getting instruction from the Arahant Samasam Buddha, a lot of people uh, go to a lot of uh, uh, meditation monks and all that uh, who are not who 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 who, 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 who way below the Buddha standard. Uh. So the Buddha already said uh, after he's gone. Uh, take the suttas and the vinaya as our teacher. Uh, so if we look into the suttas, uh, then only we can understand uh, uh, what, are, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome. Uh, uh. So the spiritual path, a lot of people forget, uh, it's not about attaining this and attaining that. Uh, it's about letting go, uh, especially letting go of the ego and the temper, uh, uh, the, 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 the temper that comes... Uh, uh, from the ego and the jealousy and the backbiting and all these things. Uh, so, if we practice correctly on uh, the spiritual path, uh, our ego uh, should year by year uh, reduce, uh, become more and more humble. Uh, and uh, whatever attainment you have, uh, you don't boast, uh, not like some people. Uh, they think they are Sotapanna, and then I heard of somebody uh, trying to tell his friends uh, that he's already attained Sotapanna because he's certified by his meditation teacher. <laughs> and then when his friends didn't believe, uh, he got angry. Uh, so, so always remember, uh, it's a path of letting go, path of uh, humility. Uh, mm. So... So a lot of people, they, 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 because of worldly habits, you know, in the worldly, in the worldly life, uh, uh, success uh, is measured by how much you have, right? Uh, so in the same way, a lot of people come to the spiritual path. Uh, they think uh, they have to attain this, attain that, and, and, and tell people they have attained this and attained that. But the spiritual path is completely different. Uh, it's a path of letting go. I think go of the ego. The Buddha says uh, that uh, we should be like a, a gong, a, a bell uh, that is cracked. Uh. You know, when a bell is cracked, uh, you hit it, uh, there's no sound. <laughs> uh, not like a lot of people, uh, they hit the bell bong <laughs> very loud. <laughs> want everybody to know. Uh, blow the trumpet uh, very loud. <laughs> So the best best uh, teacher is the Buddha. When we study the Buddha's words, uh, we know how to practice correctly. Na. Actually, these 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas, uh, they are also can be said to be just the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. So, uh, in the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the way to practice uh, is mentioned by the Buddha, I think in the Sutta Majjhima Nikaya 117, uh, that we have to start with right view. Uh, uh, if you remember, last year we went through the Sangyutta Nikaya, and there, under the Bojanga Sangyutta, the Buddha says, uh, uh, first, uh, even mentioned in, in some previous sutta we read, uh, first you got to have faith in the teacher. And then when you have faith in the teacher, you draw close to him, uh, associate with him, pre visit him frequently. Then after that, you show respect. When you show respect, uh, uh, then only you are worthy of teaching. Uh, then the, the teacher will teach you the Dhamma. Uh, and then you listen to the Dhamma. Uh, listening to the Dhamma in the, under the Bojanga uh, Sangyutta is Sati. Uh, that's uh, how to practice Sati uh, in the uh, Bojanga Sangyutta. Is listening to the Dhamma is Sati. 
and then after you uh, listen to the Dhamma, then you reflect on it, and then you investigate it. Uh, that is Dhamma Vichaya. Uh, Dhamma Vichaya, another factor of the Bojangas. Uh, so, uh, so this um, in the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the first factor we should develop uh, is right view. And right view uh, comes from listening to the Dhamma. And if you, if your mind is clear enough, uh, if you are intelligent enough, you have enough wisdom. Uh, when you listen to the Dhamma, then the Buddha says in some some sutta we, we went through, uh, you you gain a reflective acceptance of the Dhamma. That means uh, you reflect on what you have, on what you have heard uh, the Dhamma, then you accept it uh, Just by uh, but that, of course, means you understand it. Uh, so when you understand the Dhamma and you accept it, uh, you have already attained right view. Uh, and that brings you uh, into the first path. Uh, you are the first path attainer. Uh, but then uh, after that, uh, you have to continue uh, practicing. Uh, listen to more Dhamma and try to meditate uh, to sharpen your mind. Uh, get rid of the five hindrances. Uh, so in the same lifetime, the Buddha says, uh, the first path will turn to fruition, so tapanna, first fruit. Uh, so, so the first factor uh, is uh, right view. And then after right view, uh, then uh, right view will bring you into right thoughts. Lo. Once you have right view of the Dhamma, then you will start to think uh, with right thoughts. Lo. And because of your right thoughts, uh, you will start to speak uh, uh, you have to have right speech lah, because before you can speak, uh, you must think first, right? Uh, so your speech depends on your thought. Uh, so also your actions, your actions also depends on your thought. So when you have right thoughts, uh, you will also naturally have right actions. Lah. Uh, and this uh, right speech and right actions uh, plus right thought uh, will give you right livelihood. Lah. Uh, uh, and then after that, uh, uh, as you progress, uh, you want to uh, improve your character, uh, then you practice this right effort. Uh, right effort. Uh, con constantly watch your mind. Uh, get rid of unwholesome thoughts and develop wholesome thoughts. Uh, so that is uh, uh, right effort. Uh, and then after that, uh, right sati. Right sati is uh, to be mindful, uh, not to let the mind wander out to worldly things. Uh, uh, to Constantly put your mind on four objects of sati, lah. the nature of the body, uh, your feelings, watch your feelings, lah, and watch your mind, and uh, recollect the dhamma. Lah, uh, so that is right sati. Lah. And then if you uh, practice meditation, uh, um, meditation in the Buddha's teachings uh, is always samatha meditation, uh, because in the... Remember Ananda was asked what type of meditation is praised by the Buddha. I remember Ananda said the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Only this uh, is Buddhist meditation. Uh, so when you uh, practice this uh, meditation, uh, that will bring you to the jhanas, uh, the last factor. Uh, so the Noble Eightfold Path uh, has to be practiced in that in that way. Uh, so same with this uh, 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhamma. Okay, shall we end here?